Hi, I'm Amy Hill, and you're listening to You Might Know Her From with Damien and Anne. Hello, listeners. Hello. Cold weather. It's cold as shit. Hello and welcome to another episode of You Might Know Her From with Anne and Damien. Oh my God, you're switching it up. And my favorite thing that happens is every once in a blue moon when we ask our guests to do their cold open, they say, you know, it should be Anne and Damien. And I go, boom, shakalaka. Do you remember uh, we were interviewing someone once and they said like, oh, it should be Anne and Damien because that sounds better. And then they were like, well, Damien, I don't know. Neither of them are good. And I said, well, those are our names. <laughs> she was like trying to like say like, oh, Anne and Damien has a better ring to it. And then she was like, well, right. it kind of all blends together. And then she was like, Damien and they both aren't good together. And we were like, right. thank you. <laughs> I was charmed by it. Yeah, no, I loved her. She was wonderful. It was it was a fair point. The point is we're not changing our names. Here we are. We are still doing it. We are back at it. Welcome to our podcast where we shoot the shit with each other and talk to an actress each each episode about her oeuvre. That's a word I I haven't used oeuvre in a while, so I'm bringing it back. Have we ever revealed on this podcast? I'm sure we have, but you know, I love- We have. We definitely have. We definitely have because I got some notes about it. Oeuvre and out. My grandfather used to always (laughs) tell this, he moved in with us at one point and he always used to like tell the same, he always used to like say the same things as- older people do and he would always say how much can you eat when all you do is sit and i was so annoyed by it as a kid but i'm so oh that's but I'm that's, char- hate, that's hateful but i'm charmed by it now because you know, he didn't mean it towards us he was meant it to himself like when my mom would be like do you want more f- for dinner he was like he didn't he was like oh i thought w- you meant he said it to like you as a child oh no well this is and like i said i can me- eat a lot <laughs> I like your pride that you said it. That's my my one of my favorite memories with my family is that one of my aunts was married. My blood aunt was married to this like terrible, terrible, terrible man. It was her second husband. We all hated him. He was super mean. And at Thanksgiving dinner, it was me and my cousins and my sister and my brother. And we were at the kids table. And he always was commenting about like our weight, Ugh. particularly one of my cousins. Like he always had something to say about my cousins, like making my cousin making a plate too big for herself or whatever. And he was I was like getting a little round around the edges, aren't you? To my cousin, and we were all seated at the children's table. And my sister, God love her, she was like 16. She shoved her face into her plate full of like turkey and mashed potatoes. She was like, We sure are. <laughs> and like snorted her nose into the plate at my fake uncle, who eventually was, I think he died. Honestly, I don't know. Hope what he's happened listening. To him. <laughs> Hope he's listening. Leave us a review. I Here, think he's dead. God, God willing. Can I reveal a secret about you and me? that I remembered the other day and I was like we okay. should have, I yes. remember bringing this up and reminding that we did this I just brushed my sweaty hair as if like I got embarrassed in front of people <laughs> nobody can see us tell for us. the listeners tell me Anne looks like somebody who <laughs> she looks like a fozzy wig from the Muppet Christmas Carol like, thank you with like a powdered wig and then it was like taken off and the way her hair is like listen for the record it is you know quarantine is hard but I did ride my bike 11 miles to and from work today and then i fell on my bike the chain came up i was changing it in the dark i rolled home i said damien you're gonna take what you're gonna get this is me and all of my glory so please fozzy wig is asking you to <laughs> reveal our secret on air she said she wasn't gonna talk about the bike ride <laughs> here it is you're getting unfettered unfiltered and libra rodeman so the Give secret that i wanted to reveal to our listeners and remind you of is like seven years ago almost i think about six years ago I lived in L.A. for a very brief period. I moved back to New York. I was staying with my then boyfriend, and then I moved to a sublet with a friend. And then from that sublet, I needed to find another place for like a more, like a longer period of time. Anne knows where I'm going. She just gave me the old (laughs) notch. (laughs) So I found an apartment on Craigslist in Astoria, and I was like, oh, Anne, I found this thing. It might be really close to your apartment. And Anne was like, Damien. That's my building. So I interviewed for and when interviewed. <laughs> I'm nervous now. They did, I'm they nervous did telling the story. They now. did treat it as an interview. They were fucking weird. Anyway, I went and met this person, but I like didn't. And was like, they hate me. So don't tell them that you're friends with me. So I lied. But then we did were- I say, did I say they hate me? I don't think I knew them. Did they? Oh, <laughs> yes. 
I remember why he hates me. Yeah. They hate me. Yeah. And this was the apartment Damien was walking into. <laughs> Um, so the moral of the story is, and like Anne and I would be hang, we were like, oh, we have a monthly show at UCB together. We didn't, I was like, I didn't know she lived here. She's my best friend. <laughs> I would be like, hey, Anne's going to come over and rehearse. We happen to live here. <laughs> Comedy partners. Eventually we had to reveal that we knew each other because like I was in their apartment and you would come down and like have coffee in mine. It was honestly the closest I think that we'll ever get to sitcom yeah, life yes. in our life. It was like, it was heaven. We could like hang out, but we didn't have to be in each other's business. We could like roll upstairs in our pajamas. And I mean, that apartment was wild because he who shall not be named. Will you just describe like his bedroom that you lived in and like what you first saw when you got there? Oh, he had, You don't want to say it. You don't want to say it. I don't care. He had <laughs> rejection letters from like agencies like pa- like taped to his mirror and I was like, "Oh, this is grim." Also, you could have taken them down for the person who's subletting. Who's subletting? Yeah, or p- keep them in a folder, put them inside your bedroom closet. They were posted all over the wall, a little bit psychotic. It's also like the roommate who is the one who ha- we had to really like. The jig was up with the roommate because this person yeah. wasn't there. But like, if I was the roommate, I would have taken them down because I'd have been like, "I'm associated with this person. Like, take these down." The roommate was fine. also. The roommate was fine. Also, the person's name, who I will not say, it was like a, a it was a woman's name with a different letter in front. So it was like if it, his name was Sarah, it would be like Bara. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it was like it was like not a real was, name. Like if her name, if, if, if his name was like Heather, but it was like Gether. <laughs> Like, truly, truly, that's exactly... That's what his name was like. Like, Gether. (laughs) Oh, my God. That was was some of our finest hours, those hours we spent. Oh, you know what his name also could have been? Gamey, which is the male version of Amy. And this week, we are delighted. (laughs) Really good segue. Beautiful. I see what you did. Give him my old Whoopi Goldberg. The old Goldberg (laughs) transition on The View. Folks, we are thrilled this week to have finally landed the incomparable Amy Hill. We had been courting Amy. She is located in Hawaii. So it was like one of those things where we were like, maybe when you're in LA or we're in LA or if you're in New York, we'll make it happen. But like, it was always sort of like lingering. And so it was like, COVID's here. We did this. She did this with us on on Hawaii time. So thank you so much to Amy. She is like an Amy of all trades. She's in literally everything. You absolutely know her. It was also a great tie-in because we got to interview Margaret Cho last season and talk about All American Girl, which is like one of our favorite sort of pieces of pop culture nostalgia, a show with a lot of great promise with the first sort of all Asian American cast led by a woman that fizzled out after one season and Margaret Cho got a lot of flack for it. But the takeaway is that the breakout star was, of course, the brilliant Amy Hill, who was playing someone like 35 years older than she actually was. So it was great to hear, to go back to the Margaret Cho episode, hear her talk about how brilliant Amy Hill was, and then get to sit down with Amy herself. It was a dream. She's fabulous. You might know her from All American Girl, Unreal, Magnum P.I., Fifty First Dates, The Cat in the Hat, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, and Enlightened. We're just ridiculously thrilled to be here with actress and comedian Amy Hill. Amy Hill, tech savant. Thank you so much. (laughs) (laughs) I've never heard that attached to my name before, but (laughs) thank you. (laughs) Okay, Amy. For the last two years, you have played Kumu, the cultural curator of the estate on CBS's reboot of Magnum P.I. Right. This show is very beautiful and very lush. Also, Jay Hernandez. Oh, my God. I forgot about him somehow. And then I was like, oh, my God. I need to, like, follow him on Instagram. He's so handsome and, like, is a movie star. But (laughs) I'm getting derailed. What kind of touristy Hawaiian things did you do to prepare for this role as the teacher, the curator of all things. And do you have any sort of special skills now in your back pocket from taking on this role? Well, I pray that they never ask me to do hula because <laughs> I can't. But You learned though, I bet. Oh, you took a class. No, I didn't. But my daughter was in a hula halal. So I am familiar a hula halal is a hula group mm-hmm. when we were in Los Angeles, you know, because we visited here all the time and I have a lot of Hawaiian friends and 
I'm in a Hawaiian world in LA as well. And then I have Miss Universe from 1997, Brooke Lee. She's one of my best friends. She had moved back here and her mother is deep into the Hawaiian stuff. I mean, she's the president of the Royal Hawaiian Band. And I mean, she does all that Hawaiian. She is Kumu. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In real life. So I, when I got here, I just hit the ground running. I shadowed her everywhere. I made lay for, you know, Queen Lilio Kalani's birthday. I was at church listening to services in Hawaiian. I was at everything. And I met a lot of other Kumus at hotels because every hotel has a Kumu cultural curator person who sort of shares information with guests and stuff. And so anyway, I was deep into it. So I have a question uh, about the Magnum PI universe for you. It's something that I was not aware of until I sort of was in the trenches of research. So Magnum PI is in the same universe as the Hawaii Five-O reboot, as well as a number of these other CBS procedurals like JAG and I think some of the NCISs. So I don't know if you know this, there's this whole online community that has like retconned that Kumu actually appeared on Hawaii Five O because you appeared on season five, episode three as an unnamed tour guide. Yeah. And so they've actually said that could be Kumu. Can you confirm or deny for this, the Magnum PI fans, was that Kumu? No. <laughs> <laughs> I was very into it that they were like, this could be Kumu. Oh, I love that they do that. No. She was not Kumu. <laughs> no. no. All right. All right. Okay, Amy, as an actor and comedian, yeah. you've appeared in at least one episode of some of the highest profile TV series of all time. We're just going to list a few, and this is really an abbreviated list, but for our listeners, Friends, Seinfeld, Two and a Half Men, Perfect Strangers, Beverly Hills 90210, Desperate Housewives, Curb Your Enthusiasm, Six Feet Under, Glee, Arrested Development, and The Office. Check the IMDb for the full list. It's beautiful and impressive. But the AV Club has even labeled you Hollywood's go-to Asian. Do you identify with that label that they've ascribed to you? Does it feel true at all? Well, you know, it would be lovely if it was. <laughs> Every actor <laughs> would like to be the go-to Asian. Because I'm not, you know, I don't think about that. I'm just, I just feel lucky that I'm working all the time. I, in most of my mainland friends are Asian actors. And the ones that are my contemporaries, except for James Hong, he's not my contemporary, but I swear he's never going to die. He's like <laughs> 90, maybe 80. I don't know how old he is. He's really old. And I've known him forever. And he's always been old. And then like a few years ago, I was on a show with, it was called Emergency something. I forgot. With Kelly Hu. Anyway. And I, I got to the set, and he was my husband. Okay. <laughs> oh, my God. And I thought, I've crossed some line now. <laughs> but that's always how it works, that it's like this person was your father when you were younger, and now right. it's your, or was your love interest or whatever. The right. system is so fucked. Yeah. The system is fucked. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. It is. I'm happy to be whatever people, because as long as I have, a, I feel a challenge of some sort, to create an interesting character, I'm happy. You know, one of my best friends is Tai Ma, who's the go-to dad in every Asian. <laughs> mm. That's his new label, go-to dad. Do you guys compare notes about like sitcoms or shows that you've both been on in terms of like, how was that for you? How was that for you? No, we've never compared notes, but one year he was on Man in the High Castle and mm -hmm. I was on mm -hmm. uh, Unreal in Vancouver and we hung out. Mm -hmm. We, I mean, literally, I the elevators opened and I saw him standing there and I went, Ty, what are you doing here? <laughs> it was the best thing. I spent my birthday with Ty Ma. It was like so excellent. It made that whole experience 100% better because my pal was there. I feel like one of the things like witnessing going back through so many of the sort of one-offs that you've done in terms of sitcom world in particular, it's like, I feel like they bring in Amy Hill. They're like, let's bring in this ringer. It's basically, you're so good at the format. It's, if you look at a script of a, of a sitcom, Damien and I were talking about this, it's like seven jokes a page, set up joke, set up joke, set up joke, set up joke with like not lots of nuance. But I feel like what you're able to do always is ground the material and ground the funny. But have you ever like stepped back from like, a one-off sitcom that you're doing and saying like, I'm not going to do that. Or they ask you to do something in the moment where you're like, that's a no. 
No. Because usually they're willing to talk about it. Like if I see something that's uncomfortable, I'll just, you know, say, why, why would I do this? You know, usually I ask them and they're like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then I go, oh, how about if I do this instead? Okay. <laughs> they're not married to anything if I can find another way that's funny. You know, the thing that's always been most difficult, there was a certain part of my career where I felt like I was asked not to act. <laughs> you know that feeling where they said, could you take it down? Could you uh. not? You know, so you just kind of go, okay, I'll hit my mark and I'll try to be the best. But you just feel like, oh, I could, I could kill this. But if you don't want me to, I understand. Mm -hmm. And I put other actors to want me to pull back. And I go, okay, it's your show. <laughs> Do they give you that note themselves or are they like giving that note to a director? No, they'll say it to me. I mean, if you're a guest star, they have no compunction. I mean, they're usually not great actors. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> like I have to make it work for them. And I'm like, look at your job is to work with me together. We're a team. I'm not here just to, if I miss a line, that's a cue line for them. I get that. You know, it's like, you have to say that so that I can say this. Oh, yeah, that's right. But if they want me to do something weird that doesn't work for me, I really, you know, I mean, it's an actor's rule that you're not supposed to direct the other actors. It's not your job, right? Yeah, like if you don't know how to react to me or listen, yeah, you that's like getting class. <laughs> right? And you might find another more interesting result <laughs> if you listen. <laughs> or react, honestly, whatever. So for me, when I work with guest stars, because I've been a guest star so many times, when I, a guest star comes on a show that I'm a regular on, I am so like, hi, welcome to our show. And literally everybody on our, in our cast is just like that. We're all like, oh, thank you. We just look forward to working together. And guest stars are all like, God, you guys are so nice. But we, you know, we know that we need to all be a team and we have to build that team like as soon as they hit the stage. You are multiracial. Your mother was Japanese and your father was Finnish. And in your extensive career from our, you know, digging, you've played Japanese, Korean, Chinese and Filipina. Right. Now on the Amazon series, Just Add Magic, which Anne has been sending me videos and pictures of all week, your character Mama P is a Latina. How often do you get called in for Latin characters? Well, one of my first jobs, I think maybe my first job. See, I didn't perceive her as Latina, even though her name was Lord, whatever her name was, Lourdes. I think I so. Remember. I think Lourdes. I don't is, remember is, um, any of my character <laughs> names. She was not I love it. <laughs> but I perceived her, I think, as Filipina, multiracial, just but, you know, American. Mm -hmm. So I never thought. She's Latina. I think it was the character wiki online, which might be the insane fan base oh. talking that talks about some sort of your <laughs> Spanish heritage. And then, of course, there's like the empanadas yeah. in the pilot episode and a couple right, of things. Right. Well, you know, Filipinos also have empanadas. Yeah. Just saying. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fair. That's fair. Anyway, so when I first moved to L.A., I was doing a lot of these cold reading workshops, which were run by casting directors. And they were wonderful because the one that I went to, amazing actors were in there. So for me, it was like a master class in seeing how to make quick choices when you're a good actor. So I was learning. And one of the casting people called me in to audition for a part on Santa Barbara. And I was like, oh, my God. So I went in and I read for it. And I'm looking at the sides and thinking, oh, my God, this is a Nicaraguan nun in Nicaragua. And it's like a 12 week arc. It's a big piece. Somebody got kidnapped and they were in Nicaragua. Anyway. So I read it and I got it. I had a boyfriend in San Francisco who was from Nicaragua. So I could do a Nicaraguan accent because I listened to him for like three years. And I, I was like, Oh yeah, I, you know, I'll try, I'll do my best. I'll try to be authentic. And when I got to the set, my dressing room I was sharing with another Latina actress and she, we chatted, she was lovely. And she, I can't even remember her name. 
put it out of my head. And she was, you know, constantly talking about our men, our this, our, our, our. And I was like, oh, I don't know what to say. Because <laughs> I didn't want, I didn't feel like I needed to tell her that I wasn't Latina. And then on the set, people were, there were signs because they were in Nicaragua. So they were saying, what's that sign say? And I'm like, no smoking. Like, you can't understand that much. You live in LA. Come on. And the ba- background extras are all like, hey, como estas? And I'm like, bien. Usted? <laughs> I mean, I speak enough Spanish to get by. So at the end, when we're wrapping up and the the actress is like, oh, you know, we're so lucky. We get to do Spanish speaking stuff, too, because even if there's not a lot of work for us in English speaking roles, we could do that. And I said, well, I don't really speak Spanish that well. And she's like, what? Didn't your parents speak Spanish at home? And I said, well, my mom's Japanese and my dad's Finnish. (laughs) And she's like, (laughs) and I thought, okay, that's the last time I can pretend. And that's more of a political decision. I feel like I probably could bring some authenticity to a character because, you know, I would do research and try to be the best Latina Nicaraguan person I could be. But you know, because there's such difficulty in finding parts for them. I mean, I would be unhappy if a Latino hurt. I mean, it's hard to get parts. So I feel like I'm going to leave that alone, let them do it. And I, I, you know, I'm never going to find a part that's Japanese and Finnish, but I feel comfortable playing Chinese or Korean because I've been surrounded by those cultures growing up. I wasn't in those cultures, but, you know, I feel like I can sort of be authentic when I'm playing those parts. Totally. Damien and I were talking about how sort of in like the last couple of years, there's been sort of a more public reckoning with Hollywood's history of whitewashing, which is just like having white actors play like Asian and Latina and indigenous roles. Do you find that that sort of new public discourse has affected the roles that you're being offered or because you're an Asian American actress, like are you still being offered things across racial lines? Oh, I I am offered things that are not racially specific, Mm -hmm. for sure. And I think when it is racially specific, I feel like we're in another time zone where generally if it's set in like Mulan, they cast mostly Chinese or Chinese American, whether they're from Taiwan or mainland China Mm. or Hong Kong or whatever, which, you know, I sort of honor because I know... (laughs) This is horrible. But when I saw Geisha, remember that? Memoirs Memoirs of a Geisha? Geisha? Memoirs of a Geisha, yeah. It was all cast with Chinese actors. (laughs) And I being, I was, you know, I went to university in Tokyo. I lived there for seven years. And, you know, I'm rarely offered anything Japanese. I speak Japanese. When I lived in Japan, people were always like, why do you speak English so well? But the sensibility was very difficult for me to see on screen because it was not close to what I would perceive as a geisha. It's fascinating. You know, and some of them even had, you know, Chinese accents, which was like, "Mm." (laughs) they're speaking English with like a Hong Kong accent or a Singaporean accent. But these are things that I hear, but maybe nobody else hears or sees. No, I think that people do, but I think it is an interesting conversation because like, Nobody's like saying Jennifer Lawrence can't play like Swedish or British, but then there is this conversation whether it's about non-Korean actors playing a Korean family or whether it's about right. Chinese actors playing Japanese characters. You know, it sort of is like what is okay and what is not. And I think that, you know, I don't know if it's case by case or what, but it is an interesting dialogue I think to right. be having. I mean, I don't feel comfortable saying you have to be Korean in order to play Korean or Korean American. I mean, I just think you have to be a good actor and try to do a good job. You know, it would have been incumbent upon these Chinese American or Chinese actors to maybe take some, you know, work on their accents. Right. I don't know how much research they did. I just felt like it seemed lazy. Yeah. And like, is there, is they're not hiring a vocal coach? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. is they're not, yeah, is the production have... not concerned about right. the authenticity of exactly. the movie that they're making? Right. I mean, you get that a lot. But my first television part was playing a Korean grandmother, which I did a lot of research. I had a, you know, I had my uh, my Korean grandma muse that I shadowed 
for a long time. And the base of the character was grounded in my own mother, who is Japanese, which is not the same as Korean. I mean, seriously, <laughs> not at all. So I worked really hard on creating this character. And, you know, they didn't have anybody for us on set. And you couldn't ask Margaret stuff. I'm sure she would point out if something was horrible. But, you know, what was great was I did a lot of community things, Korean community things, and they'd always be like, so is your mom Korean and you married a white guy because my name's Hill. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, you know, because I know the history of Korea and Japan is not good. So I didn't want to, I didn't want them yelling at me. But they were all surprised. They all assumed I was Korean, the Korean community which really gave me a lot of comfort. But I mean, I think that's part of it is you were combining sort of your acting craft and the research with saying like, this is a big break for me. I mean, these, there's such a dearth of roles that aren't specifically like they're gonna cast a idiot white person right. in it. So I feel like there is a correction that's happening right now mm -hmm. that I think is important. But I think yeah. like what you said, the grounding of it in specificity and research is sort of where the heart of it lies. Right, and I feel like Physically, I can pass <laughs> for pretty much any, you know, being Hapa sometimes. The only thing I do sometimes is I wear brown contacts for certain characters. Like when I played uh, Grandma on uh, All American Girl, I had brown contacts. Oh, yeah. You have very light, you have very light eyes. I do. I have light eyes because of the fin in me. But sometimes if I'm playing Chinese, I don't think it's necessary because that's a big country with a lot of funny looking people. So <laughs> I feel like possible. And sometimes people will ask me to play like Cambodian and I think, I'm too big. <laughs> I don't even see anybody this look like me who's Cambodian. Maybe there are people, I don't know. You know, or Vietnamese, I just feel like, I have this stereotype of Vietnamese people being tiny and small boned, anyway. You're self-sorting right now. I self-sort sometimes. <laughs> and also that accent's really hard. So Amy, while we're talking about All-American Girl, let's talk about it. <laughs> it's one of your most recognizable credits. Like you said, you play Margaret Cho's grandmother, Young Hee. This was a groundbreaking sitcom in 1994 with the first, I think, female-centered all-Asian-American cast. We interviewed Margaret on the show, and she said she would not have done the show without you attached. Can you talk a little bit about what that role meant to you and whether or not, was it a game changer? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, really, for my career, the biggest game changer was my solo show when I did Tokyo Bound and I went, it, that became like a huge hit in especially Los Angeles. And so I was being courted by several people. And so my name became sort of bigger in Los Angeles. But because I'd been in the community and I'd done a lot of community things, I was in San Francisco and I met Margaret. We were both uh, performing at some fundraiser. And I remember thinking, geez, she's really good. <laughs> I hope she gets out of San Francisco so people can, you know, <laughs> can see how good she is. And then like the next time I see her, it's a fundraiser for the Asian American Journalists Association in Los Angeles. And she's performing and I'm doing a little bit from my solo show or maybe I don't know what I was doing. I think I did. I don't know what. But I did my mother because <laughs> people were always talking about, you know, her mother. And I happened to be doing my mother like a thing a bit. And she was like, oh my God, your mom and my mom are so similar. And, you know, I told ABC about you and I want, I want you to come in and audition. I got a pilot deal. And I was like, wow, <laughs> I guess somebody did, you know, notice you. So I went in and I auditioned and I wanted to audition for the grandma, even though I'm not old enough. But fortunately, there were no older Asian American women that were funny so, but I'd had, you know, years of doing my mother in improvisation and sketch comedy. So, and she was based in a real person. And, you know, I did that accent really good. And anyway, I talked like my mother, which is not exactly the way grandma was. Yeah. So it was a real struggle. They didn't want to cast me as that, but Margaret fought for me to play the grandma. And I got to do the pilot. And during the pilot, I kept hearing the director kept saying, you know, this you're really, you're on probation. Yeah, it's not guaranteed. And I'm like, oh, this makes me feel so good. <laughs> oh, my God. And, but it also gave me the freedom because it was like, I'll just do what I want to do. 
I'll just enjoy myself because there's no guarantee. So I did. I just had a great time. And then when it got picked up, I felt like everybody else was under a microscope and I was sort of given this freedom. Poor Margaret, you know, she had to take a lot of abuse from the community, from ABC, from everything. And I was just like free to fly and enjoy myself. (laughs) So I felt very lucky. You were the breakout, like your character was a breakout and everyone loved grandma. And you were 41 yes. when you played a 65-year-old young he. You were only two years older than Jody Long, who was right. supposed to be your daughter-in-law, right. and 15 years older than Margaret, who played right. your granddaughter. Did you find that playing that character like limited your options afterwards because people thought you were an old woman, or did it open up stuff? Yeah, literally everything I went into audition for was old ladies. <laughs> Right. And I would look at it and go, well, you know, this character doesn't have to be an old person. This could be something else. And I would go in and they'd say, what, who, you know, what's this? And I'd say, well, you know, I thought that she doesn't have to be 65. She could be 45. (laughs) (laughs) And they would say, bye, see you later. (laughs) So it was very, it was a struggle. And then I got offered because ABC wanted to keep me around. I got offered a, show with uh, Betty White and Marie Osmond and Craig Ferguson, who wasn't huge then. And I thought, who doesn't want to work with Betty White for 24 shows? So I played old again. I was Betty White's best friend on... Maybe this (laughs) time. Maybe this time. It was so... It wasn't a good show and it was a really difficult (laughs) experience. But Betty, it was worth everything to hang out with Betty White. She's just a Aww. genius and just love her so much. I love that. Can you say why it was difficult? Was it Marie Osmond and her doll collection? No, Marie Osmond was fine. Uh, <laughs> no, it's just that I felt like I was shoved down the producer's throat. So they sort of treated me badly for the whole season. They didn't want me. So mm. they just sort of. ABC was like, she's a star and we're working yeah, with her. Exactly. And they were like, okay. They were like, we, well, I, we don't want, okay, we'll take her. But we're not, we're going to make her life miserable. <laughs> oh, my God. oh, God. But, you know, that happens. You are an accomplished voiceover actor who has portrayed characters on King of the Hill, American Dad, Lilo and Stitch, Kung Fu Panda, The Life and Times of Juniper Lee. These are to name a few. What is the most vocally taxing role that you've ever maybe used in an audition and then you were concerned for your literal vocal cords when you got the role? Like I once did this character in a one act play and when I was 15 years old, that was like this. And then they were like, can you do that for the whole run? And I was like, yeah, sure can. And then of course I lost my voice. Yeah, I feel like most of the things I've done, like Kung Fu Panda, there's a lot of fighting. So there's a lot of screaming and fighting Mm. and you know, getting hit and stuff like that. But it hasn't been too taxing. I do remember one thing I did was Sanjay and Craig. It was just a guest star thing. Mm -hmm. And literally I blew my voice out by the end. Like the next day I was like whispering. You could feel like something had popped. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) It was screaming constantly. And not screaming like an open throated scream. It was like, It was not good. I mean, they were lovely people. (laughs) Everybody, I love animation. People in animation are fun and funny and easygoing and fun to work with, but uh, some of it is just really hard. Amy, you're credited as additional voices in Moana. What is the deal with that? Oh, you know, I still, well, I don't now, but I did ADR. So, you know, I speak Japanese. So they would call me to come in and do like Japanese dialogue at the airport or whatever, whenever they went to Japan in any show. I did the Japanese toilet in uh, New Girl. I was the Japanese toilet that opened in Japanese. I spoke to them. Oh my God, I'm obsessed <laughs> It's with the this. best. Yeah. So, you know, you go in and you just hang out and you get paid exactly the same as you would if you were a guest star in a show. And you get residuals, just the same. Oh, so I'm. Geez, I did the Gong Show when I moved to LA, and all my theater friends are like, "Oh my God, Amy, no!" <laughs> it's AFTRA. I get paid, 
scale plus 10, whatever. <laughs> so I don't have an ego around any of that. And I have fun and I love the people that do it. So Moana, my Hawaiian friends, were all like, Amy, so we gave your name to blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, you know, I don't actually speak Hawaiian. I can't. <laughs> and they said, oh, we'll, we'll help you out. No, no problem. So I went and I did background. I mean, I could do pigeon or whatever. So, yeah. Okay, Amy, as we mentioned before, you starred as Mama P on three seasons of the Amazon series Just Add Magic. You also starred as Mrs. DiPaolo on That's So Raven. And you were also in kid-friendly movies like Big Fat Liar, Cheaper by the Dozen, Max Keeble's Big Move, and Herbie Fully Loaded. Can you describe for our listeners what the vibe is on set when you are one of the only adults surrounded by a ton of kids? You know, the only... <laughs> I feel like I'm throwing shade. There are, you know, all of them, like uh, That's So Raven, Raven Simone, wonderful. Everybody was younger, but they were all very professional and they did their job and they were they had great parents who were around who made them they're better than like regular kids polite yes ma'am no ma'am you know stuff so i liked those shows the only one that was weird was herbie fully loaded Lindsay would come to set whenever she felt like it and nobody would say anything like you're late and then she was constantly breaking character i mean we'd be doing a scene and she'd start giggling and nobody mm-hmm. said, Lindsay, you're eating up time. Michael Keaton was in the scene too. Michael Keaton, I just adore. He's such okay. a good actor, professional, mm-hmm. wonderful, pleasant, generous spirit. And I'm thinking, why don't you yell at somebody? Because <laughs> I'm, <just, laughs> I'm just a tiny character on this. I'm just a little doctor. But everybody, nobody seemed to care that we we're just sitting there and wasting time for no good reason. I mean, is she that good that she can do that? Mm, I didn't think so, but no. that's just me. Okay, Amy, you are well known for your comedic chops, but you've also worked with a number of prestigious filmmakers in some dramatic fare. This includes one of your first films, Wayne Wang's Dim Sum, A Little Bit of Heart, oh, yeah. Yim Ho's adaptation of Pearl S. Buck's Pavilion of Women, a small role in Oscar winner Stephen Okazaki's Living on Tokyo Time. You also narrated his Oscar-nominated documentary, Unfinished Business, about the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. We know and have admired your comedic work. You're clearly a brilliant comedian. But do you have ambitions to do more dramatic work? Like, what else do you want to do in your career? You've done so much. You know, when I, my theater work includes a lot of drama. So I never really think about anything. I'd done so much comedic work. And I remember one of the first plays that I did after a period of time doing sitcoms. It was a David Henry Wong play. Daniel Day Kim was my husband, though. Oh, very nice. In that play, I die of an overdose of opium. And very sad play. (laughs) Very dramatic. Anyway, I walk on stage and literally the audience just laughed. And I thought, okay, i got to take charge (laughs) as soon as I get on stage because they're not going to go well. (laughs) And so it's like you have to bring everything into your... I don't know how I did it, but the next night, different. And the rest of the run was fine. But it was like that first time I walked on stage and everyone was like, "Ah, it's not going to be funny. It's just not going to be funny, people. (laughs) So I don't really approach comedy in any different way than I do drama. It's usually the situation that creates the comedy. And if you really believe in the situation and situation's crazy, then you, it makes you laugh. The things that make me laugh when I'm watching anything is somebody's reaction to the situation where it's like, how'd this happen? I mean, so I try to be as honest and real doing comedy. You're just playing the truth in comedy. I am trying to just play the truth. Yes. And like enlightened you are do is, a, is like a quote unquote comedy, but your character isn't like delivering punchlines. No. It's like you're playing it no. deadly serious. You're just no. playing the truth in and it. And the truth is, you know, Laura Dern's character is nuts. <laughs> so... <laughs> The comedy is coming from her. And the more I play the truth, the easier it is for people to feel empathy and also laugh at her craziness. 
Amy, listeners know I'm a lesbian. Damien and I are lesbian enthusiasts. One of the things that we love most about you <laughs> is that you have played many lesbians by our count at, at least four explicitly. So that's Strip Mall, The Hughleys, Enlightened, and The Unbidden were the ones that we could track. So what do you think it is about you that has casting directors saying, Amy Hill, yes, lesbian? Well, it's interesting because for a real, a long, there was several years that I was like, like the Hughleys, I wasn't a lesbian until I came out. Right. Nobody told me <laughs> until that script. And I went, oh, I'm a lesbian. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I think the title of that episode was like, guess who's coming out to dinner. Yeah. <laughs> Which is fine, but it was just so funny because it was in a row, a lot of them. Strip mall, I knew going in that I was a lesbian. It was so great because I could chew up the scenery. It was so much fun. Since my San Francisco days, I would get called in, you know, for a part and it'd be all guys and me. So I think, do I have like a lot of male energy too? Is that the thing? (laughs) I don't know. I did this a series called The Naked Truth. And it was written for a Danny DeVito type. So (laughs) again, me and a bunch of people. And I thought, oh, okay. I can't tell you how many times it's like, it could be a real butch man or Amy Hill. (laughs) I read that you, it was between you and LL Cool J for that Danny DeVito role. Neither of you are a Danny DeVito type. But guess what? You got it. You got it. I got it. I got it. But that was another one of those hell seasons because I was a tabloid photographer and Princess Diana was killed just before we started. Oh. So it was like, what are we going to do? Right. We have a contract, so we have to keep her. But what do we do? Anyway, one episode I had six syllables. <laughs> yeah, you too, Nora. Five syllables. I'm sorry. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I was paid more per syllable than anybody in Hollywood, I think. <laughs> Amy, you're really setting us up here. So Uh-oh. this is the part of the show, our rapid fire. Okay. Theoretically, this means we're wrapping up. Excellent. <laughs> Theoretically. These are just, there's no segues here. Ann and I are just throwing a lot at you. So this first one is a lot. Bear with me. Okay. You appear as Mrs. Kwan, the children's babysitter in the live action remake of The Cat in the Hat opposite Mike Myers, who you have said was a hermit and a diva who made everyone wait and had a minion on set who held chocolates for him in a little Tupperware. You also joined the cast of the aforementioned The Naked Truth in its third season and have said that Taya Leone hated the job so much that she was actively trying to get fired. And you were a series regular on Polly, a sitcom centered around the notorious weasel himself, Polly Shore. Amy Hill, this is our version of Fuck, Mary Kill, but it is Fire, Hire, Admire. Of those three people, of Mike Myers, Taya Leone, and Polly Shore, who would you fire from a job? Who would you hire for a job? And who of that group do you most admire? I would fire Taya, put her out of her misery. <laughs> hire. Oh, God. Real tough competition between we, those two, Mike Myers and Polly well, Shore. Well, you know what? I'd hire Mike because, you know, the end product is good. It's just I wouldn't work with him. I'd hire him sure. to be on another show. <laughs> and so you're saying you admire Miss Polly? I actually admire Polly. He was incredibly professional, very oh. sweet. He was lovely. And it was like, I watched and thought, how could people hate him so much that even before the show aired, it was canceled practically? We did six episodes. I don't know if it was a good show or not, but I loved everybody on it. They were all lovely people and Polly was so sweet and you know he tried really hard I don't understand (laughs) so I admire him for taking so much incredible criticism just like they wanted him to die and you know oh my gosh really I felt like they would they hated him so much and he uh just kept going okay Amy you co-starred opposite Drew Barrymore and Adam Sandler in 2004's 50 first dates, but you have publicly said that mega producer Amy Pascal tried to recast your role after she saw the table read. In the end, joke was on her because you were never recast, and in fact, it was one of your biggest hits. Fast forward to 2014 when Amy Pascal's offensive and racist emails were leaked to the press. The question is, how satisfying was that reveal? Well, you know, I've already moved past that, so I don't feel 
particular uh, enmity towards Amy Pascal. It's just part of the struggle of being in this business. And part of me also feels like it was my responsibility at the table read to do better. So now when I go to a table read, I give a hundred and because, you know, I thought we we're just, you know, sussing out the script and I'm, you know, so I wasn't giving all my energy to this table read. <laughs> I was seeing how everybody else was to see how I fit into the show. Yeah. Also, you had already been hired. I was hired. So, <laughs> so not that I thought, oh, you know, I wasn't trying to, I didn't, you know, stumble over my words. I knew what I was doing, but there's a part of you that sort of is, uh, sort of neutral, not too big, because you want to see who these people are and what takes their give anyway. So I don't do that anymore. I try to make a committed, even at a table read. Okay, Amy, word on the street is that Kenny G went to the same high school as you. Yes. Did y'all do high school music? Did you do high school musicals together? No, he was younger than me. But not that much younger. Yeah, I looked it up and it seemed like you would be in the same school yeah, at the same time. Yeah, he was in the same four-year period. I think he was maybe a freshman when I was a senior. I don't know. But uh, he wasn't like fancy popular or anything in high school. That's shocking. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> but I met him in Hollywood at some party and I said, hi, uh, you know, I went to Franklin High School. No, first I said, hi. I'm a fan of your, I don't know what I said, but I said, I went to Franklin and literally his face dropped. He could give a shit. <gasps> Kenny G. Fuck Kenny G. Yeah. I was being well, nice. He wasn't popular or cool anyway. And also you were not a big fan of Kenny G. You were being kind. Yeah, I was being kind. Hi. <laughs> of course. Of course I you were being kind. I Seattle oh, yes. or whatever I said. Yes. I went to Franklin because you know. Franklin High School was like the coolest school in the city. So if you ever say you're from, Fra like the governor, Gary Locke, went to Franklin. We, you know, Franklin is like the Yale of, <laughs> of Seattle. Well, Kenny like G is big, dead to us. I'm he is a, dead to us. I'm not into Kenneth G's energy. <laughs> Moving on. Okay. Okay. You had guest spots on Desperate Housewives, Glee, and Beverly Hills 90210, all shows that had notoriously drama-filled sets. Which one seemed the most toxic to you? Oh, Beverly Hills 90210 was the most really? toxic. <laughs> yeah, it's weird because I was also a friends with one of the producers. When I forgot. Maybe it was the producer. Somebody, I was friends with somebody, and they said, so was Shannon there? And I went... <laughs> I know. God. I didn't see Shannon. Oh, was she on time? I don't know. Oh, it's so weird. You know, I mean, it was like so weird <laughs> because I guess, and this was the very beginning of the show. It was like the first season, I think. Yeah, you were in season and one. They were yeah. all asking how Shannon was. How did she act? What was you know? And I thought the set felt fine. All of them. Uh, Desperate Housewives. I only worked with Felicity, and she was delightful. I feel like theater people, when they go into the business, I mean the business side of the business, they, they are they still have a good memory, a grounded memory of what it is we're doing. We're just acting. We're working together. Yeah, they're actors, yeah. not like people who no, are just famous. who are trying to be celebrities. But you did act with Jason Priestley. You ran up to him. You had your headset in. Yeah, you were like, he "Do was, you want to be in this?" The boys were both. They were delightful. They came into my dressing room and said, hi, I'm Jason. It's going to be great working with Aww. you. And who's oh, the I other guy? Him. Luke Perry. I'm Ian I know. Was Ian Zeering there? He's my favorite one, Amy. Yeah, the blonde, I, curly I hair know, one. I don't remember. I don't remember <laughs> anything. It was a long time ago. And I remember <laughs> it was a long time ago. But everybody was really nice. But they were all concerned about Shannon, which was mm. interesting. I didn't work with her, so I don't know. Okay, Amy, you starred as a restaurant owner and resident lesbian Fanny Sue Chang on the pseudo sitcom Strip Mall, which aired on Comedy Central from 2000 to 2001. You got to do a lot of broad, cleaver-wielding comedy on this bizarre, campy show, which starred Julie Brown, Victoria Jackson, Maxwell Caulfield, and Cindy Williams. If you were going to break social distancing rules, which of these former castmates' homes would you enter without a mask? Julie Brown, Victoria Jackson, Maxwell Caulfield, and Cindy Williams. I would go to Julie Brown's house for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cause she seems cool. She seems cool. I feel like she wears a mask <laughs> <laughs> and she washes her hands. I feel like she'd be clean. Victoria Jackson for sure does not wear a mask. No, she I doesn't. for sure. I don't think she wears a mask. I think God's <laughs> protecting her. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Amy, you won $701 as a contestant on the gong show. What did you spend that money on? 
oh, come on, I was broke. So I put that in the bank. That's why I'm still here. I'm the actor who saves their money. Well done. Yeah, well done. Okay, Amy, you appear in a memorable Seinfeld episode where Jerry Stiller grabs your breast. You've said that you love Jerry Stiller and his late wife, Ann Mira. Uh, they were both wonderful. What other actors were you excited to work with who then exceeded your expectations? Oh, Sean Connery. You mean on that show? Or no, no, in, real- on, in, on, any, yeah, in any, in, any, in your Connery. whole career. Because, uh, you know, he was the James Bond that I grew up with. So when I worked on Rising Sun, Sean Connery was, so we're in the trailer the very first day. He's singing songs. He's, he had to wear a wig thing and he had, the wig was being glued on. It was up like this. And he was like, how do I look? How do I look? I mean, he was (laughs) so self-effacing, delightful. He had that twinkle in his eye. I adored him. And when we were working, if he was off camera, he would stay and give you your lines all of the actors did. But during one of the breaks, we were just chatting and he said that he started in musical theater. His first job was doing a sa- uh, South Pacific. South Pacific. South Pacific. Thank you. I love you. He was in South Pacific and he sang <laughs> to me. <gasps> did he give you some enchanted me. evening? I can't because it was all a blur because he's singing. I'm just going, James Bond is singing to me. And he's kissed me on this cheek. <gasps> And then Harvey Keitel sang and kissed me on this cheek. Oh. Both of them are dreams. Because Harvey Keitel is another one I grew up with. That's strong sexual male energy in that room. And I like what I'm hearing. They were good people. Good people. Okay, Amy, based on your Instagram, we know that you teach acting. When you're given a script, you spend time beating out your scenes. You're a real actor. But be honest, did you beat out your script for your role as Jocelyn Davis in Big Fat Liar starring Frankie Munez? Oh, I'm sure I did. I do every script. I could have two lines and I'll beat it out. Did you beat out those five syllables from The Naked Truth? Probably. (laughs) I love you. Yeah. (laughs) Nora. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You, maybe. Yeah, you too. Nora. I don't know. I'm sure I did. Thank you so much, Amy Hill, for joining us on You Might Know Her From. This has been a total pleasure. Great. It was great talking to you guys. You really do your homework. You know, I just love the dedication, truly. (laughs) The idea that Amy Hill had to suffer through life with apparently an impossible Taya Leone (laughs) with five lines that she would dedicate her life to beating that script out. I really love it. I think it was five syllables, not five lines. Oh my God, you're right. (laughs) Yeah, five syllables. One thing that didn't make the cut of the final interview, but I was super charmed by was the fact that... (laughs) Amy worked on the animated show, The Life and Times of Juniper Lee. And we were like, do you know who created that? Do you know who? And she was like, of course, I know who created it. His name is Judd Winnick. And we're like, yes, but do you know why Judd is famous? Because he was on Real World San Francisco. And do you know? And she was like, you know, he married. And we were like, Pam, we really had a whole shtick about Real World San Francisco with Amy Hill. But she knew. She did know. She did know. I. I was like, I was like, what's your favorite shaved ice in Hawaii? I was like, do you know Lorraine's where you, where I got banana bread and shaved ice? And she was like, Lorraine's. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. And she was like, no. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I love you, Amy Hill. It was great. She came to us very early and we were really throwing a lot at her at 8 a.m. Hawaii time. Yeah, she was a dream. She was a total, total total dream and so i love this little game that we've invented this season like it's fun for ann and i but the way we were connecting amy to our next week's guest well first ann you said one so she is in 51st dates amy hill is in 51st dates with adam sandler who was of course on saturday night live yeah she was also in the cat in the hat starring mike myers who was also on (laughs) saturday night live and she was in Big Fat Liar with Nora Dunn. Very excited to find that one. Who was also on Saturday Night Live. Who was also on Saturday Night Live. Okay, so Nora Dunn's not our guest next week, but our guest <laughs> is maybe on one of those that show that little show that all three of those other people. <laughs> 
Guys, we have a former SNL cast member. Let me tell you, this SNL cast member is a doozy. She's got some really great bombs to drop. I loved her. And I loved Amy Hill. And you know who else I love? I love y'all for listening to us. It would be so beautiful, kind, generous, thoughtful. We would just call you magnanimous to your face if you would be so kind to leave us a review on the Apple Podcast app or wherever you listen. It's the best thing that you can do. You can, of course, subscribe and you can get your friends to subscribe and take your papa's phone and and subscribe on (laughs) his phone. I had papa in my head because I was thinking of mama, mama from Bill Billy (laughs) Elegy. And then I was like, she has a flip phone. She doesn't have a smartphone. Like what? And then I was, oh, I was editing myself. Her name isn't Mima. It's like mama. It's it's mama. It's mama. I love Glenn Close. I Here's the thing. A lot of people have contacted me and are watching a lot of Glenn Close right now. And I think it's wonderful. People said, our friend Ben said, you know, what what Glenn Close do I need to start with? Angie just showed her daughter 101 Dalmatians because I told her to. And then I got to reveal that Glenn Close was in hook in drag before she got put in the boo box. I love Glenn Close. That's all I had to say. Please leave us a review. Please subscribe. We miss you. We love you. Just help boost us up those charts, babies. And while you're doing that, follow us on social media. You can follow me at Damian Bellino. And you can follow Anne at Rodeman. That's R-O-D-E-M-A-N-N-E. You might know her from is produced by Ann Rodeman and Damian Bellino. That's us, us two humans, sitting in front of your computer screens in your ear holes, looking at each other as we always do. Thank you, thank you to our consultants at Grumpy Entertainment. Thank you to Jason Jude Hill and Daniel Sears. All that editing you hear in your holes on your head is also by the great Daniel Sears. And so many beautiful thanks to Gang for all the music you hear in these episodes. You can find Gang on iTunes or wherever you listen to music. Did you like Puck? Oh, yeah. From Real World San Francisco. Like, were you sexually into Puck? Was it not into him? Like, definitely was like, oh, I think I'm into him. How about you? Yeah, no, I liked him. I liked when he, like, put his finger in the peanut butter. Same, obviously. It was, like, turned on me all. (laughs)